Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to today's episode. This is your host Nino, and it shall be a pleasure for me to go with you today through this short and sweet book, modestly named Starting Lisp for AI from 1987. And here already starts the first funny circumstance. At that point in time, Common Lisp already did exist. However, this book still deliberately ditches both Interlisp and Common Lisp in favor of MacLisp. <laughs> so, that's a bit of an unusual choice, but it gives you a feeling for the fact that when Common Lisp was introduced and for a couple of years afterwards, it was by no means seen as necessarily the victor of the Lisp dialects competitions, so to say. And being, of course, much larger than the previous Lisps to a great part, I also understand the basis for such skepticism. Now, the book is divided into two parts. In part A, he is teaching you the fundamentals of Lisp. And in part B, you will be learning about um, certain artificial intelligence introductions. In general, though, I must say, the book at not even 200 pages, you know, here we are at, like, what is it, some 150-ish pages, is just not long enough to teach you anything deeper or more fundamental. And it is a bit of a property of the book to show many things just like, so it is, this can be done, but without much background as to why that might be so and what else it might relate to. I personally find the beginning, Introduction to Lisp, a little bit... Um, a little bit, perhaps, not sufficiently clear for somebody who hasn't had much touch with Lisp before. But it's also not particularly bad or something. So it's just sort of average. Yeah. The introduction of symbols, for instance, here is, is, is um, these, these are quite good examples. In particular, also this one I find funny, but yes, of course, one can take that as well. And he is trying to explain you in the beginning the building blocks of, of Lisp. And tries to rather quickly introduce you to the possibility of composing lists out of symbols and other lists. But nonetheless, this, for somebody who hasn't been working with lists yet, may still be a bit hard to penetrate. In particular, why these would be so different from the point of view of the machine. Right? Like, if you haven't seen this before, then you see the parentheses are somewhat differently placed. But what does that all that much matter? Becomes clear only once you are perhaps a little bit more acquainted with the principles of Lisp in general. So I find that slightly confusing, but but not terrible either. Like you, you get a bit of an idea and uh, assuming that you may be using additional aids to or have some knowledge beforehand, that, then that might be survivable, but it's it's not perfectly great. Then he tries to explain to you eval, but equally that somehow does not work out all that great because he's saying like yeah eval can be difficult to understand yet it is at the heart of the way the lisp language works but that does not really help us right so neither the this textual explanation nor 
these examples later on all that much help to to make someone understand why eval so much matters to lisp and what exactly it is and he could have simply put it that way that this is the interpretation of the value of either some variable or some expression in a manner not unlike such evaluations are happening simply in other programming languages as well. Then, uh, it's funny actually, he is bemoaning the names of car and cutter over here, but he does not propose any who knows how viable alternative, you know, like just criticizing car and cutter is not enough in particular as he does not address the idea that out of car and cutter you can compose incredibly complex structures like kdadadar or something like that, whatever you need at the moment. So that is really the reason why, in my opinion, these names have held on, because they're simply practical for explaining complex structures. So that he just, you know, glances over. Now then, as we are um, going over here, only here does he then explain that cons takes two arguments and um, goes a little more into the depths of how this list, compos uh, list composition actually works. And in my opinion, he could have done that a little bit earlier. But this upper example of how you can comp uh, com compose a three-element lisp through consing in the end with nil, I find, on the other hand, quite nice. Because uh, this does show you a little bit the difference between using cons and append. Though again, for me this is more bearable because I already know what cons and append are. If I were to be seeing Lisp for the very first time, I believe I would have found that personally perhaps not sufficient to give me a clear understanding of the idea. Now he does something which I am not a fan of. He is introducing side effects of functions in a way before bothering much with functions themselves. And that is, in my view, the reversed way. Normally I would actually recommend introducing one to pure functions and then only afterwards coming to functions. But I did discover something funny. You know, I always give an example of, uh, like when I test a Lisp interpreter, of a very simple function, which is simply adding one to the argument. Like you give it five, it returns six, yeah? Well, <laughs> he's using here the same example. He's just calling it add one. I'm always calling it PL for plus or PL1 or something like that. <laughs> So, so he uses it as add one, of which of course in Mac Lisp anyway exists as a function, but he he uses here actually a fine and easily understood, at least for me, example for how to define a pure function. Just I believe this should have happened before the discussion of the side effects. Now, finally, at page 25, we are looking at giving atoms values. And I believe that had he started with that a little bit before that, it would have been also easier, you know, to sort of explain uh, the functioning of eval in general, you know. <laughs> like, if you would be going for values for atoms pr prior to trying to explain their evaluation, that would be perhaps more logical. On page 27, then, property lists are introduced, and this is again one of those things which just come from above, strike the reader, and it's not 100% clear what they are and why they are and why one would be needing them, so just property lists are dumped onto you right away here. Despite this sudden introduction, the examples delivered to them are actually not so bad at all, though. So, 
you do get a bit of an idea how to put properties and how to get properties from here. But why wouldn't you do that with property lists and not with some other list processing approach of your own choosing? Does not become 100% clear. What I do decisively like is that he then introduces simply a read and print and reading and printing is kept here exceedingly easy. Like, you know, I actually prefer that in, in old list, lists that they do not have these ridiculously convoluted ideas of format, which more than anything else is distracting one from simply inputting and printing values in a simple fashion. Like, I understand that it might be needed, but in general I see that common lisp has in some regards extended much beyond the limits of what was usual under Mac lisp and that this is not working for its own good. And then, in the chapter on making decisions, he does something I decisively approve of. Namely, he introduces you to equal without bothering with ek. You know, and like to predicates in general, you know. And I actually find that a good idea. Like, ek is a rather specific concept that you would understand if you already are into programming and bother about what pointers and memory locations and so on are, whereas equal much more corresponds to what a normal person would understand as two things being equal. So that decision to, de to ditch ek in favor of equal, I clearly am amused at and support. And now perhaps let's jump to page 44 as there is a decisively good outline, in my view, of recursion. Like, recursion is explained actually nicely, and nobody start, stops bashing Fortran, but here apparently also basic, though for all I might be aware, also COBOL at the time may have been in, in a similar situation that there are languages which basically do not allow recursion, whereas in Lisp it is a central topic. It is one of the fundamental activities yeah, that you would be handling through recursion. And that does not remain entirely abstract, as, for instance, later on, he actually gives you quite... Uh, like an, a pretty understandable trace of how recursion would be working, right? And that is actually also a nice manner of elucidating the trace facility itself, giving you an example of defining um, membership, yeah? So, and, and membership with equal, not with ek simply, yeah? So that is... A nice way of showing wha how one can use a recursion in order to handle Lisp program uh, uh, problems, like list processing related pro problems in a way. And then, in particular here, yep, on page 54 and following, he's actually going to show you how to implement through recursion a merge sort function. So there you actually get um, a rather a rather nice and practical elucidation of how you can be using recursion in order to solve a common problem sorting in Lisp. Now while you know, even modern lists and so on may be having uh, sort predicates already included. It's nonetheless a good exercise to see how you could be doing that in a more practical fashion and not just theoretically mentioning that you can, you know, check that somewhere. Well, and then another further 
actually well useful example concerns map car where you are introduced to it again in a rather practical fashion so that again I find actually well done and certainly better done than some of the beginning examples of the book which for an absolute novice would be harder to understand so we can say all in all that recursion in this book is treated pretty reasonably that unfortunately goes a little bit at the expense of iteration i told you it's a brief book it's around 150 pages long you're on page 60. so iteration is handled over here and in a you know sort of negligent fashion the only thing that you are being really shown is using prog with go to and and that's it you know like he does mention that there are things like loops and and do and so on and while but he does not go into that and that i find a little bit of a pity because you're thereby not really put into a position to easily follow lisp code that you would find in the wild i mean people do use other things than prog and go in other words, you are in a in a position as if you would be reading about Lisp 1.5 rather than about uh, not that old-fashioned MacLisp. Like MacLisp is actually a rather reasonable dialect and you would have other iteration possibilities as well. And then finally, this first part concludes with something sort of entertaining or perhaps a little... <laughs> a little concerning namely it's a chapter on the implementation on of lisp and here again lists are being discussed however in a much better and more reasonable way than at the very beginning of the book like i think that he should have maybe shifted some part of that chapter to the very beginning of the book so you get a bit of an idea what this is that you're working with and it does clarify a couple of things that might better have been clarified in the very beginning. And that sort of concludes the first part of the book. Let me see. Yeah, here you're having branching structures and so on, you know. <laughs> Would have been helpful to see that previously. And then in the second part of the book, you are getting into... Applications to artificial intelligence. All right. And all in all, I must say, the examples chosen to be given here are actually pretty good. The issue is rather that you do not understand wherein these examples are embedded. Like why exactly these are chosen, what exactly they represent, what much other things for they are used for, and so on. It's just like a series of examples being slammed in your face, which are good examples, but it is not in entirely clear to you why you get to see these. Yeah? So, in the beginning, he starts with searching techniques, a classical task of every AI book, and you get to see a sort of implementation of a, well, simplified game of checkers in a way, you know. But it's not really delved into the issues of Samuel's game of checkers, of early chess programs, of these ideas that maybe through game programming you might gain a deeper understanding of the methods of thinking in humans as well. You know, this sentence by Kronrod that 
chess is the drosophila of AI. These things all get omitted. It's just like, this is how we do checkers. This is how we do search. And while this a bit too hands-on approach might be missing a little bit like the vetting and the depth of the matter and a historical perspective, nonetheless, there is introduced in pages about 90 to 92 a pretty good explanation of heuristic search, you know. But again, this is also just a little bit um, slammed onto you, you know, <laughs> like these ideas of the search space, of how it grows exponentially and so on, that all is not really that much made a topic. It is just still reduced a little bit to the sentence here that you are trying to find a best solution, but what do we mean by best in this context? And, and that's about the depth you're getting to have here. Not without a certain amusement, I must mention though that this is still nowadays the issue. You, in many cases, get explanations along the lines, yeah, but my neural net said so. <laughs> yeah, but what parameters did you choose? What um, network architecture? What examples? In what context? How were they selected? By whom? According to which criteria? How are the criteria determined? And so on and so forth. You also nowadays oftentimes lack the depth of explanation of solutions, in particular of heuristic nature, when explanation would be actually necessary, particularly because you are less formally underway than might be perchance desirable for some task. And similarly to that, on page 102, yeah, on page 102, he's jumping straight into production rules. Why? <laughs> you know, now evidently we're talking here of some form of expert system. And he does give you also a hands-on example, once again, about some farm animals and, and things like that, right? But he does not really venture into rule-based and case-based systems and forward and backward chaining and uh, induction, abduction and deduction and things like that. This all does not really play a part in that. It's short of, sort of just shown what are production rules and how can you do them. But the embedding, the history, the issues with formulating such rules and, and for instance having production rules to interoperate in unexpected fashion and so on, this is all not made a topic. So you do not actually get a deeper understanding of expert systems in general and that pr the production rules approach is a very good one but only one out of several. It's just like boom, production rules. And in a not all that different fashion is also a parser introduced. Here we are on page 120 and pattern matching is being shown. The examples, as always, continue to be actually pretty good. But the issue one, one again has is that this is an extremely superficial treatment of these affairs. So on the negative side, you do not get any deeper understanding of the underlying issues. On the po positive side, you do get a quick overview of what one would be doing in the 1980s when handling artificial intelligence. So here again, pattern matching is shown. This is, this is all nice, but surface ambiguities are not really addressed. Yet, as far as hints go, at least he is going towards, um, yeah, template-based question answering. I think this was over here. Yes, so template-based question answering is a little bit mentioned so that you're having some sentences preset to the system and the system can then perhaps answer in a somewhat schematic way questions based on that knowledge. Yeah, actually over here 
you're having such a thing that the lion has four legs and things like that. But for instance, the categorization ambiguities and, and, and things like that are not really addressed, you know, that, for instance, the famous Nixon diamond, that Nixon was both a Quaker and a Republican. So the question is, should he be uh, assumed to be pro-guns or not? And as a Quaker, not. As a Republican, yes. And where do you categorize that under when you're trying to answer that question? These issues are beyond the scope of that book. So yeah, over here then, you actually see the introduction to parsing. And it is a simplistic introduction once again, because uh, it is just shown as a sort of not too complex task, while in reality parsing is an incredibly complex task, because it turns out that human language highly depends on the context, and that some sentences of Equal structure might be very hard to understand. These are so-called garden path sentences because your brain first tries to interpret them one way and then finds that wrong and then recovers from that. Whereas others of the same structure are easy to parse. I'll give you an example. Famously, the horse raced past the barn fell. It is this raced and fell which appear to be in conflict. And you only later understand that it is meaning the horse that has been raised past the barn has fallen. Yeah, somewhat differently expressed. So this is a garden path sentence. Whereas the woman dressed in white married is immediately intelligible to you. And in such issues, this does not even go into. It's just like, how do we do parsing? And it's all just like... Um, shown as a straightforward thing, which, to be quite frank, parsing is simply not at all. But all of these criticisms are understandable if you, in particular, go towards the end, where you're having the suggestions for further leading. And if you look a little bit at the Lisp books, which he is recommending, then you will quickly notice these are introductory Lisp books. So, in some way, this book understands itself as a sort of pre-introduction to Lisp. And that you're supposed to afterwards read perhaps another book on Lisp. That's a fine idea, except at the beginning with um, the introduction of Lists themselves is a little bit perhaps chaotic for a real total novice. But other than that, still my compliments for the introduction of recursion. I believe that was done very nicely here. Some of the explanations may be seen as a little bit chaotic and the treatment of iteration is simply insufficient. But the overview of artificial intelligence tasks common at the time, and some still relevant today in many respects, is actually pretty good. And that concludes today's review. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you will become regular guests in this channel and that I may greet you here soon again. Until then, thank you once again and have a wonderful time. See you and goodbye.